Coming up next on this week computer hardware, Hackintosh build for OMG Chad, Borderlands 2 physics testing, AMD's 5800K APU benchmark, Samsung's 840. Let's talk TLC. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, this week in Computer Hardware, episode 189, recorded October 4th, 2012. Build a better Hackintosh. Welcome to Twitch, this week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Gordon, and this is the show that aims to bring you the most important news in computer hardware, a little bit of the tablet lifestyle, and of course, we love your viewer questions. We answer them in each and every show. This show has a very special viewer question coming from Chad of the brightly colored hair. We'll have him on a little bit later. But right now, <laughs> let us bring you Mr. Ryan Shrout from PCPer.com. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing okay. How are you? I spent uh, the first part of my day digging holes for trees. Uh, so awesome. can only get more exciting after that. Was this like an Arbor Day project? Are you greening the community? or, or did It was, your wife it was a like, My Wife's Day project. It really didn't have anything to do with any national holidays, though. <laughs> yeah. good thing. What kind of trees did you plant? Uh, weeping willow and cherry. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. Are you feeling very sort of green thumbish today? You, you just feeling... No, I no. Instead, I feel like I wish I had worn leather gloves when I was digging the holes because my hands feel pretty raw. Uh, we do have to dig through a lot of clay here. We don't have. It's like you get like six inches of topsoil and then you get thick clay after that. I uh, I am familiar with the clay of the Northeast, and let me tell you something: the sandy loam my house is built on. Awesome for digging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also awesome for liquefaction in the case of earthquakes. But that is not the subject of this show. This show is computer hardware. And I have just the article that distracted me just seconds before we went uh, live today. Borderlands 2 physics performance and physics comparison. It seems like Borderlands 2 is the game physics accelerators have been waiting for forever. Um, you guys ran a, a gigantic four-hour launch event with Borderlands 2 came out. And, you know, PhysX, you know, which is something I think we had kind of just forgotten about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, it's got PhysX and transistors. So uh, it's it's been a technology that's been around for a long time, but very few games have implemented in a way that is in any fashion interesting. I remember many, many years ago when we first started hearing about the company, well before AMD owned it, um, or I'm sorry, before NVIDIA owned it, where they were talking about w what cool things you could do, how you could make every object in your game um, destructible, you could interact with any of those types of things. Uh, and the problem became... Uh, hardware integration. Nobody. This was when they were selling separate physics acceleration cards, right? And that. Imagine the day when you had a, a you had a video card, an audio card, and a physics card, in your system. Uh, but long story short, Nvidia bought them. Now it only gets accelerated on Nvidia GPUs. So, you know, you, you, nobody wants to go a hundred percent in with implementing these kind of interesting and cool physics effects uh, because mm -hmm. you're cutting out half of your market essentially with with that uh, gameplay and you can't make the game drastically different with nvidia cards than it is with amd so instead what we get are a lot of these kind of extra effects uh particles fluids cloth those types of things that can add to the ambience of a game but they don't really change the gameplay dramatically uh, borderlands 2 is one of the better ones in terms of uh, adding a whole bunch of stuff and making it look cool right so uh, you'll see if you if you pick up the game or if you watch the video in our story, you'll see the difference between physics on high, medium, and low. And you'll see, you know, there's there's uh, cloth on some and no cloth on others. You'll get dynamic fluids on some, but no fluids at all. You'll get particles uh, on some, but a lot more particles that interact in different ways with the environment uh, and, and at high, right? So I think it was it's, the it's pretty cool. Reviewer who was just like, I just spent an entire episode. He's like, I just spent hours in Borderlands 2 shooting tarps. He's like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> you yeah, know, it's you laugh, cool. But it's, it's beautiful and it's compelling. It's, it's cool and it's, and it's fun. Uh, but, it, you know, you can play without it. So what we did with this was we, part of, part of the story is the video where we compare 
yeah, physics on high versus medium versus low. And you can see uh, if you're watching the video version of it, physics low has some of the stuff, but you'll notice on the high side on the left, there's there's this gravity effect that's being that's affecting the fluids and the particles in the world, uh, but those don't even exist on the low setting. So you, you can still play the game on low. It's not that big of a deal, but it's it's cooler on medium and high. And this is one of the best implementations of it so far. The second half of the story was to compare uh, an AMD card and an NVIDIA card, how much performance degraded as you went from high to medium to low on these physics settings. We ran it 1080p, kind of, you know, max everything else out. Uh, and we used the GTX 680 and the 7970 gigahertz edition from AMD just to get the top uh, top level stuff from both guys. And what we found was, if you look at the second page of the story, the performance on the AMD card almost perfectly matched the performance of the NVIDIA card when physics was set to low. At low, there's no GPU accelerated physics at all. There's only, it's just CPU based stuff. When you get into medium, you'll see that the performance drops pretty substantially in certain cases. Yeah, if you look at that, you'll see the cases where the red line is, is well below the blue line, you're seeing these, obviously there's a bottleneck of some kind. Uh, and then if we go down to physics on high, you'll see that performance drops off the cliff and never comes back up. And we're talking some pretty dramatic differences. I think with physics on high, the difference is like 66 versus 33 or something like that for the averages. Um, and the explanation we got for this is while uh, Borderlands 2 will let the CPU attempt to handle the physics processing of these additional particles, the CPU can't quite keep up. And it's not because the CPU is at 100% load. We have some of those graphs on there too. It's that it's not multi-threaded in a way on the CPU that it can be on the GPU. So mm -hmm. what you what you see instead is essentially a single the, the physics thread of the game being hindered and having to wait for these other calculations to take place on the CPU. And so as a result, the entire engine kind of stalls out waiting for these things to happen and your frame rate drops accordingly. So uh, it, what was interesting to us just from an experiment standpoint is that usually in the past, up until this game, you haven't been able to enable PhysX at all when you had an AMD card installed. They just kind of disabled it, right? They just said, no, don't even bother trying. This time where they would let us enable it and see what happens. And now we get some interesting results to see how it actually affects performance. And how do you feel about it? I mean, is, is there any, is, I mean, you know, do you, I mean, because it's probably one of the things you've said a couple times is that, you know, there's nothing in here. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's compelling. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting use of the physics acceleration. But there's really no, there's nothing, there's nothing, it doesn't unlock any aspect of the game other than eye candy. Um, Correct. And it looks like, to me, it, it looks like a relatively minimal impact on frame rates. Or am I just having a bad Well, it's minimal the on the NVIDIA side, but it's right. substantial on the AMD side. Um, okay. So the debate always comes down to... Oh, there it is. Yeah, physics medium. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at the wrong graph. Scroll, yeah. So, but the, the issue is always, you know... So this physics is an NVIDIA-owned piece of software. It's middleware. Uh to be fair, though, that middleware is used on Xbox games, PlayStation 3 games. You know, it's, it's using a lot of different engines. But when it comes to the PC, developers have the ability to enable these GPU accelerated aspects of the game or uh, of the physics engine. And they can, but it's, mm -hmm. it's at the detriment of AMD products, right? Because they don't support the GPU acceleration. And that is by NVIDIA's choice. Right. That's it's their product. They paid for it. They pay for the development. They, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it makes sense. That they're not going to open this up uh, to to or, or spend money and resources making sure that it runs well on AMD GPUs. So instead we get, you know, basically, in my opinion, the same status that you had before. If you have an AMD card, you should probably turn physics on low. Right. and play the game that way. If you have an NVIDIA card, even down to like a 660 or 660 Ti, you can play with the physics on high and you'll get a um, improved experience, not necessarily better. I guess it, I guess it, it's better, it's more interesting, uh, but right. you're, still, you're not going to miss any of the game or anything like that. So, you know, it's one of those, it's another instance where if you're an AMD fan, you have AMD hardware, you're going to miss out on this and it sucks, but that's the way it's going to be. That's, it's not going to change. Yeah, it, it's you know I don't I don't really anticipate uh, as as it seems like to have really good physics development you need it on on both sides of the fence 
uh, AMD and NVIDIA, and there's just no way NVIDIA is going to do that, no matter how much better it might Correct. make gaming. If, if there were uh, a physics engine that were that was GPU accelerated and would run on both NVIDIA and AMD, I think you could see some really, really cool things. Like the whole idea of the physics engine when it was its own independent company was imagine, you know, Borderlands 2 where everything you shoot can be destructible. Any buildings can be destructible. Any items can be destructible. And that's, you know, if you have really high physics processing capability, you could be able to do that. But nobody's going to spend the time to develop that type of world that only half of their PC user base to be able to take advantage of. Well, we're going to be building on the AMD versus the world theme. But before we get into that, <laughs> let us discuss AMD Trinity, the A105800K and the A85600K. Josh wrote this up for PCPer.com. Quote, Trinity, where to start? I find myself asking that question as the road to this release is somewhat tortuous. <laughs> that's, that's a scary way to start a review. Um, <laughs> You know, expectations for Trinity are high. Um, Trinity APU with AMD discrete class graphics. Everybody, you know, I, I, is it safe to say in, in 2011, 2000, late 2010, early 2000, when, when this name first surfaced, we all thought this was going to be, this is going to be the big Core i5, Core i7 challenger. And then much to our shock, AMD was like, eh, we're... We're not really going for that part of the market. So AMD last week announces that it's going to be, you know, it beats the Core i3 uh, in certain benchmarks put together by the AMD. And where are we at with this CPU after the full round of benchmark testing in house at PC Per? It's really, it's really not going to be that that much different than Lano, right? So the A8 series of APUs was based on Lano. It was the first consumer APU available. Right. Uh, well, desktop consumer. Uh, APU and Trinity really doesn't change a whole lot on that. I think when we first started learning about Lano, we first started learning about that its CPU performance wasn't going to be that great. Mm -hmm. There was the 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 carrot on the stick was really, Trinity. Really and good graphics on this yeah. chip. Really good graphic, impressive graphics on this chip. It is it is easily the best, still the best integrated graphics you can get. Uh, if you look it's, at the last two pages of, of the review, you'll see uh, Borderlands 2 and uh, Skyrim testing. And uh, it's, it's, it's about 20 to 30 to 40% faster than Lano, mm -hmm. Trini the new Trinity parts are. Right. Uh, and it's significantly faster than like the Intel Core i3 uh, Sandy Bridge parts and even the Core i7 Ivy Bridge graphics. It's, it holds a considerable lead over that. Um, right. That was never really in doubt, though. Because the, the integrated graphics on AMD's parts has always been great. Intel has been catching up, but they've always been better, and that's still the case. I think what a lot of people were hoping for was some improved CPU performance with this part, and that just didn't happen. The new pile driver cores um, that replaced uh, the bulldozer cores on the first Trinity, oh, I'm sorry, the first APU, Lano, don't really add that much to performance. They add some in, in, a, in a select few instances, and they actually are a little bit slower in a couple of select few instances. So it, it's not going to drastically change the market in terms of uh, low-end processor performance, low-end processors in general. Where, where Trinity will thrive and possibly be a very successful part is in the same markets that Lano had that chance as well. Mm -hmm. Super mainstream gaming, low-end gaming, right? You're going to build a $300, $400 box that you want to hook up to a TV and, and use as a home theater PC and play games on it sometimes. It'll also be good just as a home theater PC in general. Uh, it has lots of graphics capability. You can take advantage of uh, slightly accelerated GPU uh, transcoding and that kind of stuff as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's super, super low cost. The highest end Trinity part will be $122. I think it's selling for $122 or $125 today. And you can couple that with a $80 motherboard or something like that. And so for $200, bucks, you have got your CPU, your GPU, and your motherboard. Add in some low-cost memory, get uh, either a really cheap SSD or a low-cost one terabyte hard drive or something like that, and you've got a complete system in the three dollars to $400 range easily. It's going to be able to handle... Most anything you want to do, it's not going to blow you away in terms of speed and performance uh, on, C on the CPU side. But if you're going to do mainstream gaming and you can do some interesting stuff with it, we've got a story we'll talk about. Um, I, I think if we switch it around, we'll talk about it next. We're talking about completely passively cooled 
systems using Trinity as well. Uh, you can you can do some pretty cool stuff with it. It's not it's not an Ivy Bridge killer. It's not a Sandy Bridge killer. It's not targeted at that. What we're hoping is maybe uh, the desktop CPU only called Vashera, the Trinity based AMD FX part, will come out. I don't know, maybe in a month or so, and hopefully we'll see some competitive performance there uh, at higher clock speeds. But for now, Trinity is very much taking over the the market that Lano had. Uh, but a little bit better. Is there anything else to say? <laughs> it's, just, it's like, hmm, set-top box, good all-around workstation PC. Uh, the, the truth is, you know, is, is and, and maybe we're, maybe I in particular am being unfair to this part because it's actually most of the people, most of the jobs I see most people doing on most computers this actually is more than enough CPU for them. They're not editing mm -hmm. video games. They're not doing high-end 3D gaming. They're not trying to support, you know, three simultaneous monitors. You know, if you're a light gamer or just not a 3D gamer at all and you're primarily dealing, you know, with typical household computing tasks, you know what I mean? This, this is a perfect, this is the perfect, you know, it's a great chip, maybe not the perfect chip for somebody who does wants to do a little bit of gaming, doesn't do a lot of high-end computing stuff like video editing or audio editing or, you know, Freaking compiling code, uh, you know, it's a nice part. I yeah, I just, you know, we'll we'll talk about AMD versus Intel in a second. I won't I won't get into that. We should probably right. go straight to the Samsung Series 840. Alan Alventano for PCPro.com got flown out. Samsung flew uh, Alan and several other industry peeps out to Seoul, Korea, the 2012 Samsung SSD Global Summit. Uh, basically, in, in the last couple of weeks, Samsung came out with the 840 Pro, their new top of the line, kind of an incremental evolution from the 830. Um, basically, a uh, higher clock controller, uh, newer, faster flash. So the 830 becomes the 840 Pro and gets all kinds of goodness in terms of performance. The 840 is the consumer marketed. Uh, basically, I guess you could almost say the 840 is the new 830 and the 840 Pro is the new high-end 830. But what's interesting about this is the first time we've seen uh, triple-level cell flash used right. uh, mass marketed in SSD. So single-level uh, single cell is basically one bit. Um, um, you know, we're basically an individual flash cell can sort of like one bit. Multi-level cell starts adding a triple level cell. Um, it's an interesting idea that you can use fewer cells to store more data. The trade-off is that you sacrifice some performance, you sacrifice some long-term reliability, you don't panic. Uh, Samsung does very good firmware and they have very, very good products. Um, but write speeds are where things start to suffer. Um, 60 gigabytes, 120 gigabytes, 250, 500 gigabytes. And the specs are a sequential reads of 540 megabytes per second, sequential writes at 333 megabytes per second. For the 840 Pro, we're talking about 450 megabytes. Uh, and, uh, you know, we could talk IOPS, but I think it's a little inside baseball for most of right. us. Uh, Alan was, for the most part, impressed. He expects us to get down to like 80 cents a gigabyte once they scale it up. Um, superb read performance. A uh, reduced cost per gigabyte compared to the 840 Pro. Uh, very mm -hmm. low power consumption. Uh, the cons, quote, relatively poor mixed read-write performance, and uh, it's only coming with a three-year warranty. Um, but then again, most of the people I know are upgrading their drives faster than that. Uh, I would also say that Samsung's, I think the drive will probably handily outlast the warranty on that one. Uh, MSRP um, is... Where did it go? 120 gigabytes, uh, 110 bucks for the basic version, 130 for the kit. The 840 Pro, the MSRP is 150 dollars. Uh, 250 gigabytes, uh, 200 dollars versus 270 dollars for the 840 Pro, and then 500 gigabytes. Brace yourselves, 449 dollars or 599.99 for the 840 Pro. Now, um, I'm going to be the first one to say this: it is slower. Uh, in terms of uh, mixed read-write performance, uh, Alan called it relatively poor. Um, but compared to your spinning hard drive, your traditional hard drive, this will still handily uh, <laughs> destroy it performance-wise. Um, I think it's, you know, is it slower than other SSDs out there? Is it slower than the 840 Pro? Yes. But it will still crush, destroy, obliviate, abuse, or whatever particular, you know, descriptive phrase you want to use compared to a traditional rotating hard drive. 
Yeah. Um, I, I kind of considered this uh, the ideal mainstream kind of con just consumer drive. You know, right. it, it's slow on writes, but it's fast on reads where most people are going to want that performance. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it will be very low cost, right? That's, that's you know, it all it's all dependent on that. If it's the same price as a Vertex 4 or whatever, then get a Vertex 4 because it's got fast reads and fast writes. But if it's less expensive and you don't really care about write speeds, then go with whatever is going to be cheaper. And we, we have a good uh, history with Samsung and uh, their firmware and all that other kind of stuff as well. So um, I, I'm hoping once this, it's going to take a couple of months for maybe maybe a month for it to come out and settle at a price, right? It'll mm -hmm. be a little bit higher because it's new and it's cool and everybody's wanting to, to get their hands on it. So it's uh, shiny. I, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm hopeful that this, uh, that, that the triple level cell flash will, will be an answer to cost, at least in the not too distant future. We hope so. Yeah, and and Alan makes it pretty clear in the final thoughts on the, on the review. Um, you know, it's a budget version of the Pro Level SSD. Quote: Triple level cell flash is slower to write and provides less endurance as compared to MLC units. While the 840 does perform quite well as a first generation TLC SSD, there are several areas where it has no choice but to be outmaneuvered by the MLC equipped competition. Um, you know, and he points out a few years ago, MLC took a while to catch up performance to SLC. Uh, Precisely. You know, and this gets back to our classic line. If you're not going to install it today, save your pennies and buy the latest and greatest when you have the money put together to buy it. Because in six months, there's going to be faster drives for less money or this drive is going to be available for uh, considerably. Well, maybe not considerably, but for less money. Um, never hurts to wait. So silent PC build. This looks really pretty. The uh, Asus silent PC with the AMD Trinity APU. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool looking. Um, and we've gotten we've had a couple of interested parties here uh, looking at it because it is a completely passively cooled uh, Trinity APU based system. So, the, you know, the, the processor we were just talking about a second ago, um, it's based on it's it built inside a Streecom FC5 chassis, which uh, does double duty as a case and heatsink for the AMD APU. So the case itself is actually you know, acting as the heat sink on it. If you look at the picture of it, you can see the heat pipes actually go into the body of the case itself. It's actually pretty cool. The case uh, is and gorgeous. And yeah, it is. And kind of media stack in a really nice way. Yep. Uh, I remember seeing some of these cases that would work as passive CPU coolers in the past. The issue was always you had to build for like specific motherboards, right? Because the whole placement of the cooler, if it's built in as part of the chassis, gets to be pretty complicated. Um, so, you know, it's it's one of those things where you have to double check on your case and your motherboard and everything else that you're that you're working on. Um, but it's it, they're also not inc incredibly cheap. Uh, but in terms of cool factor, just nice to look at as well as super quiet. It doesn't get any quieter than a, if you get you get that you get dims, you get an SSD, you have no fans in the, in the case, you got a completely passive system. Completely passive, completely silent system, which, right. uh, you know, is pretty impressive. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, you know, again, obviously I'm obsessed with uh, home theater PCs. Uh, yeah. It's the side effect of working with Robert Heron. Um, but it's a really, I mean, you know, anytime you can eliminate any kind of fan from the home theater room. And, and of course, you could say, like, put it in a delete expletive closet. I get it. That's what I did with my gear. But I love the idea of decent gaming performance uh, and absolutely having no fans, which is pretty awesome. Um, and I got to say, the Streetcom chassis are absolutely gorgeous uh, and available in a whole bunch of sizes uh, here in the uh, United States. From PerfectHomeTheater.com, and the FC5 starts at brace yourselves, people, two hundred and forty-seven dollars and fifty cents, and ratchets up to two hundred seventy-two dollars. Uh, but if you're looking for a full-size box, you can get it down to a, a more relaxed $180. <laughs> nice. They're beautiful cases. No, I just, I love the, I love the idea. So for so long, like a home theater PC you had to have a, you know, <laughs> a display on the front of it. Right. And in, invariably the display was so bright, it actually distracted you uh, from your HDTV or your projector. 
Um, so it's, it's nice to see a little understated design. <coughs> Pardon me. Oh, no problem. Not so understated. Jeremy's discussion on PC Per, why even Intel fans want a stronger showing from AMD. Is it price? Is it performance? Is it new technology? Oh, boy. <laughs> so this, this story, it's actually um, a little paragraph on our site that uh, links to a story over at techreport.com where they did a really good um, kind of information gathering bit where they looked at prices over the last couple of years of AMD processors versus last couple of years of Intel processors. And what you'll see is uh, a lack of active competition from AMD has caused Intel's prices to basically stagnate. And it's something we, we've talked about on the show quite a bit that it's the case, but it's interesting when you see it in a like hard data form, right? Here's the price at Newegg um, over time and it drops maybe 10 bucks, but nothing other than that, right? Even if you look at a processor like the Core i5 2500K and 2600K, so the, the best Sandy Bridge processors, they even today have almost not dropped pricing at all. Uh, and I think what was another one, one of the Core i3 2105s or something like that was, was almost no price drops uh, at the low end or at the mid-range part level, whereas AMD prices continued to, to drop. They were trying to drop in order to make themselves more competitive with what Intel was putting out. Intel had no reason to because they knew they were beating the best that AMD could, could throw at them, so they never dropped prices. And that's you know, we talk about it a lot here. That's bad for the consumer. It's bad for our markets. Uh, it means Intel doesn't have to push technology forward. They're not trying to figure out ways to push frequency. They're not trying to ways to push their process technology further in those directions. Um, and overall, it's just a, it's a bad thing when you have an unhealthy two-party system, I guess, to, to, to stay on topic with the, <laughs> the culture as it is now, right? If you only have one player in dominance, they can pretty much do whatever they want. They're not pushed to perform in any kind of fashion. And um, it's a, it was a really good write-up over at Tech Report, uh, just a collection of this data to show you how Intel prices have not changed over time. That is a problem if you like yeah. affordable parts. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing is, is can AMD, I mean, AMD has basically publicly declared that they are no longer going to fight Intel for the high right. ground Core i5, the Core i7, the bleeding edge, high performance processors. Because to put it bluntly, they, they failed. They, they, they could not deliver. They could not scale their CPU technology to keep up with uh, Intel. I, you know, I got to say, I don't really, you know, I, I don't really see anybody stepping up to challenge Intel in that area. Um, call me crazy or? or, or no, you know. there's not. I mean, the only person that it could possibly be would be Intel. And the, right. what I think many people fear will happen is that this kind of the consumer desktop space will just stagnate out. It'll get to a point where Intel's like, yeah, we're the best here, but we don't have any competition. There's no point in us developing more. You can already see that a little bit in that their big push into mobile markets, cell phones, tablets, that type of thing. That's that's where they move their direction to, their focus to, is not on high performance, but on right. low power. And you know that's someplace where they still have competition at, right? Qualcomm, NVIDIA, the whole ARM community is their competition now. That's who they consider their primary competition. Right. I mean, at this point, is, you know, is there are so few applications that actually constrain a Core i7 CPU. I mean, are there any video games that can even load up all four cores of a Core i7 at this point? Games? Oh, sure. I mean, <clears throat> you're, you're not going to get to 100% utilization on processors, sure. but if you can get four to six threads kind of hopping around in the 30, 40% range are doing pretty good. And there are several games that will do that. Um, <laughs> so several games out of the hundreds, if not thousands right. currently sold. Well, you got to think about it. We're at the end Steam. of a console <laughs> game cycle. We're at the right. end of a console cycle. So these next iterations of consoles will be much more heavily multi-threaded than, than the ones we have today. And they'll all be based on the same architecture too, which will help. And what you'll see is, you'll see kind of like we saw at the beginning of the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 launch, um, almost an equalization, but then you'll see the PC take off again in terms of better performance and better graphics because mm -hmm. as people learn how to use the new hardware for the consoles, they will then take advantage of, kind of use it as practice to, to shove that stuff onto the PC and get improved stuff there. So I, 
because the Xbox 360 only has three cores, and right. I think, you know, even taking advantage of all of those is pretty hard uh, with the current tools they have, they don't really see a need to go further than that. And, and, and to spend the money to develop an engine that can isn't going to give you a whole lot of payback. But future engines, I think, will will not have a problem in that area. We wait with bated breath as computing speeds and application performance stalls. Yeah. I'm exaggerating, people. <laughs> I think Intel will keep doing it. They'll just spend less money uh, uh, focused on it. It'll be interesting to watch. We'll all be on... Uh, We'll all be on tablets in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't think of anything. Actually, I held some tablets today that would be very compelling, but oddly enough, they all had like Core i5s and Core i7s inside of them. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, our first viewer question of the day, and before I get to it, let me say subscribe to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, T-W-I-C-H, that is twit.tv slash twitch. If you want to track down the links to subscribe to the show or search for This Week in Computer Hardware on iTunes, or any of your other favorite podcatchers. Uh, email us twitch, T-W-I-C-H, at twit.tv if you want to ask us a question, or fire your Twitters out to at Ryan Shroud or at Patrick Norton on the Twitter. And right now, joining us, not from Texas, but from Petaluma, California, Chad Johnson, you may know him as OMG Chad, is looking to build his very first gaming PC. I am. I'm really excited about this one, and I needed y'all's help. <laughs> we should point out there is one major constraining factor on this build. The number one most important factor for Chad's build because of what he wants it to do. Not that it's a gaming PC, not that it's an editing rig, not that it's a streaming box, but that you want it to be a Hackintosh. A Hackintosh. I, I didn't want to spend Apple prices for an Apple rig. That's so, so yeah. So, so the things that that I really want to do with this is game. Um, I would like to have a really good processor to transcode video. So once I make it into a Hackintosh, that I can use its processing power to transcode my videos way faster, and right. <laughs> then maybe do some let's plays, that sort of thing. Right. And then in terms of cost, I'm thinking around the. Two thousand dollar area because I'm going to be using yeah. it for work and for play. Um, I don't s mind spending a little bit extra because I'm going to be doing actual work that makes me money back later <laughs> on it. Hopefully, that is an important thing. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So right. I, I assume you spent a little quality time up at uh, Tony Mac X eighty six dot blogspot dot com. Exactly, I did, and and I was originally going to go for an ASUS motherboard. And then poking around Tony Mac X86, it, that that was kind of a no-go. It's either it's gigabyte or get out, pretty much, in terms of the Hackintosh um, scene. And so I switched to a gigabyte board, and I was happy with that because I wanted a FireWire port on the motherboard. I didn't really want to buy a, a PCI Express you know, FireWire <laughs> thing. And so it has a FireWire 400 on it, so I was a little bit happier about that. Um, and then, and then I've ki I kind of reached my limit, and I asked Reddit and my Twitter followers what they thought of my build. So I actually sent it uh, to the fans. This was actually before I knew that I'd be getting your advice. Way, way better <laughs> advice than, than uh, I expected. And so I, I sent that to Reddit. Uh, yeah, I was okay. going to say, I, I, Reddit's pretty smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of Reddit out there, and they have a lot of good answers. Um, it's funny, uh, you know, the comments on Reddit use multi-beast for the install, for parts, of course. This is like the first post from iEnthusiast. Uh, you know, go to TonyMaxX86.blogspot.com. If, if you've never, com, not con. If you've ever seen, if you've never been there, if you're building a Hackintosh, one of the first places to go is TonyMaxX86 because he keeps a list of up-to-date uh, hardware options for building a Hackintosh. Because if you don't, choose the right motherboard, uh, as Chad has found out, much to his shock and dismay. Uh, you know, it's not really about the motherboard you want. It's about the motherboard that will actually boot uh, the version of OS X that you want to install. Um, you know, have you changed? I know so we've got some comments on uh, on memory options. Uh, right. Because you were looking at Corsair Vengeance, uh, four, four, four gigabyte sticks, Right. Uh, and so, I, yeah, yeah, that's that's almost exactly what <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys about. The, the, the comments back that I got were that 
uh, right now, I so just a quick rundown of, of some of the things I have. I, is I have a, a gigabyte motherboard. I'm using four DIMMs of four gigabyte memory. I'm using, I have a solid state drive and a 1.5 terabyte uh, spinning drive. And then my video card, I went with the um, uh, GTX 680 from mm -hmm. EVGA. And right. then I, I just liked, there's a case that Corsair makes that is very military and I just kind of like that. And then a 750 watt power supply and that's that's all the interesting stuff. And and based off of the PC Per article about the South Korean monitors, I decided to go <laughs> with the three hundred dollar fourteen forty monitor from South Korea. So I'm gonna get one. Have of you those. ordered that yet? I haven't ordered it yet. Okay. Uh, I haven't ordered anything yet. This is actually tomorrow morning. Will be when I sit down and find and and bite the bullet and see my bank account just shrink and shrink right. and shrink. Yes. Right. That that is that is when you've crossed the line into right. almost no return. Right. Um, so, you know, the the motherboard selection will 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 say has to be there in order for the if the Hackintosh mentality there, and it's and it's a fine board anyway. Uh, the processor is the top Ivy Bridge you can get in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, if the only the only way you can get faster is if you get into X seventy nine, uh, Sandy Bridge E stuff, but I probably wouldn't recommend that uh, anyway. Uh, 16 gigs of memory is a lot. The only thing I might look at is if you can get two by eight mm -hmm. and, and instead of four by four. And just, just in case you want to add more later. If you're going to do video editing and that kind of stuff, you never really know what that, where you're going to go with that. And if you can upgrade to, to two by eights for close to the same price, I might do that. That, that, was, a, that was a Reddit comment, and I, I, I definitely think I'm going to do that. That was something I didn't even think about. Um, I just thought, I have four DIMM slots, so let's right. go with sure. four four things um, yeah well the whole i need to fill all my dim slots like <laughs> it's just not what it used to be <laughs> right right uh, and the eight gigabyte I, I, sticks actually are, are relatively inexpensive yeah. i'm sorry go ahead Brian. no i was gonna say um i was just moving on but the, the samsung 830 is a great drive uh 256 mm -hmm. gig would be give you enough for your os and games and uh applications and that kind of stuff the right. spindle hard drive it's up to you i don't know how much and if you're doing video editing do you have an external backup configuration already set up? Is this going to be at the Twit Studio? This is this is not. So this is my personal machine. So mm -hmm. the the spindle drive was what I was expecting to put the Mac operating system on, and that's where I would be right. doing all of the video transcoding. Okay. And I've had finicky success with um, with the eSATA cables to my hard drive docks. Uh, sure. I'm using a, a hard drive toaster just to drop in hard drives. And I've had mm -hmm. such finicky success with that that I expected that I would use the Firewire 400 cable to transfer the video, transcode it, and then retransfer it back to a to an archive drive. Um, I wish there was a Thunderbolt adapter card because the more right. I play around, as much as, as much as $50 cables make me want to pound my head against the nearest wall <laughs> or desk. Um, Thunderbolt is so fast and it's such a good physical cable. Like you're running, the, the issue you're running into is eSATA. eSATA is like, SATA is a mediocre cable. Like it's, it's not bad if it's a light cable, it's inside a PC and you're not moving it. As soon as they took that cable design outside the PC, I think it just, it just, all of the flaws <laughs> right. started to reveal so, themselves. It's, just just so you know, Ken just brought this yeah. over to me. We have one we have one here and he said that this is this motherboard is uh Hackintosh certified or or people have been using it. This is the the Z seventy seven X UP A UP five TH oh. and it has two Thunderbolt ports on it. Oh. Get it, get it, get it Jeff, So now get it's gonna be it. more yeah. expensive and then you're gonna have to worry about getting Thunderbolt accessories as well, which are gonna be pretty expensive. Um, That's okay. The, on, I, I the only other option would be to use your USB 3.0 port as an external um, solution. Yeah. Assuming OS 10 will recognize USB 3.0. Right. Um, yeah, that's true. I guess that may not. That's, that's kind true. Of my, my and and, and Ken said that this will work, like the Thunderbolt ports should work on uh, the OS. So, and Intel, it does have Intel based USB 3, so it should work on the, on yeah. the, uh, that's exciting. As well. Do you happen to know? Does that have a? At the moment, what I'm using is this laptop, and I'm using the FireWire 800 and uh, port out, and that happens to be fast enough 
for editing the video straight off the drive. Do you happen mm -hmm. to know if that board has a FireWire 800 as well? Because I could um, switch. I could switch to Thunderbolt if I needed to. It would be a another investment in drives. Does have it an does? IEEE 1394 <laughs> port? Oh, oh, oh. I'm really surprised by that, actually. I thought for sure I was going to have to tell you no, but uh, Wait, yeah, it does. Is that? Is that, Gigabyte is one of the few companies <laughs> that still does that, and I think it might be because of the Hackintosh crowd, to be completely, completely honest with you. Um, it is going to be a more expensive motherboard. I was just going to look it up, um, so I don't know about how specific uh, that's, your, that's fine. your it, budget it, that's, is. That's such a crucial, <laughs> I mean, that's such a crucial part of the entire build is the the media tr media transcoding i mean it, it takes up to 16 hours to transcode the video that i want to want to do and that's unacceptable so that's such an, a crucial part of this build that that's doable the uh it's like do you care about saving 60 oh, bucks sorry. more 60 bucks more is totally doable and, and what i was about to say is that would probably allow me to downgrade that uh, the Mac OS hard drive to not need a whole terabyte and a half. I could probably get away with, I mean, another 256. Um, actually, I have I have a few 80 gigabyte hard drives that would probably run just fine. They That's could, awesome. yeah. If you don't, if you're not worried about uh, I/O I/O performance on that that particular partition, another SSD would be great, just mm -hmm. in terms of improving your overall um, user experience in the Mac OS as well. But Have if you, it's uh, oops, cheaper too, do you care about? I mean, you know, do you care about overclocking? In which case, you might use a thirty-seven seventy instead of a thirty-seven seventy K. Two eight gigabyte six uh, eight gigabyte sticks of Corsair will run you about twenty bucks less uh, at Newegg to wow. still get the sixteen gigabytes of, of uh, uh, sixteen gigabytes of memory. Um, man, I think where else? The, the other thing that machine, that was dude. pointed out on Reddit, which I, I had not read enough reviews up to that point, is that I knew I knew that I would be spending around five hundred dollars for a uh, video card, and then mm -hmm. they pointed out that I was choosing the six eighty, that the six seventy can be clocked really close to mm -hmm. the six eighty, and I just I I just. For, uh, you know, stupidness. I was just like, well, four gigabytes is bigger than two gigabytes, so <laughs> I'm gonna go with the 680. Um, it's, but after reading those reviews, I'm I'm really compelled to to jump. I I think you know the 680 is a great card. 684 gig is really for if you're gonna do multi multi monitor gaming. That's really when a four gig frame buffer has really become important. I think I think even on that 27 inch. 2560 by 1440 monitor, a 670 is going to be plenty. And you can get those for like $399, so you could take $160 off your price right there. Um, and yeah, if you're overclocking these boards is, is really simple as well. And you can, you know, use, if you get an EVGA or a Galaxy card, uh, Asus, MSI, actually they all kind of come with their own overclocking software. It's real easy to do as well if you want to do kind of creep it up a little bit closer to the 680 performance levels. Um, and you can, and you can, you know, pay for that different motherboard by taking a little bit off the graphics card at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. By the way, I got to say the tactical case, the uh, Vengeance C70 from Corsair, one, love the style, two, uh, already has 320 millimeter fans loaded in it, so you're not going to need to spend any money on fans unless you want to quiet the machine down. Um, yeah, I like that. That's a really neat case, by the way. I, oh, I chose it. Practically purely on style. I, I just I like that it had handles, and if I ever needed to take it somewhere yep. in a pinch, I could handle it. And and uh, it had, I have it on my screen. It has this really cool gunmetal look to it. Uh, it just it just screamed of something it's, that it's, I needed. It's it's a cool case, and don't feel bad. Most most case most case selections are done by aesthetics anyway. Right. Um, yeah. So you know, unless, unless you have a really really specific use case for it. I need nine gigantic five and a quarter inch drives that are accessible from the front right, of the case. Right, exactly. <laughs> Something unique like that. Overall, though, I think um, a really good build. You know, if you're interested in the motherboard, uh, the model number, you know, I, I can email it to you after the show. Z77X UP5TH. The TH standing for Thunderbolt. Get it? I don't know. And it's, and it's got two Thunderbolt ports on it. It's actually one of the first motherboards to have dual Thunderbolt outputs on it too so 
there's there's a lot of expandability options there. Power supply is good. 750 watts Corsair Pro Golds are are great power supplies. 750 is more than enough. Uh, and then uh, the Vengeance K60. The only thing I'll make sure you, you they are loud keyboards. So if you're <laughs> gonna do streaming, uh, like with a headset on, oh, that I did not is think not about that. Work. Because the clicking can be pretty obnoxious. You are on right. That. We are, we're actually using Microsoft soft touch keyboards for that kind of stuff only because the, the, the keys are kind of annoying when they get picked up by a, a, a boom mic. You're right. I'm, I'm going to have to nix that. Yeah. The, 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 one of the reasons that the memory is so high is that I do a lot of Minecraft gaming and you, mm -hmm. I can easily send Minecraft four, eight gigabytes of, of memory to be super smooth. And the idea was this rig would allow me to do those let's plays, the the play along sort of videos. And yeah, that that motherboard, that that keyboard is not gonna fly. I'm gonna have to kill that. Yeah, yeah. A anything that has um, cherry keys right. is is gonna is gonna is gonna right. potentially be and, and I've even I've even used that keyboard. We reviewed it uh, yep. uh, here, and it was just it's such a comfortable keyboard. I knew that I was getting the clicking stuff. I just didn't think about actually streaming with it and how ridiculous it would be. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can always own a second inexpensive, less tactile keyboard that you plug in when you're streaming or that's, actually, you know, the, that's what we do. Like we have them and we just, we have two, they're both plugged in all the time. We just kind of swap it whenever. Perhaps a quiet Apple Bluetooth keyboard with a command key. <laughs> Something subtle. Right. So. Nice. Right. Are you excited? Are you going to build it? Can we I'm help so you build excited. It? So, so actually, Iaz already grabbed me and because he saw awesome. my Twitter post and went, well, this needs to be a know-how episode. So uh, nice. I'm going to buy nice. everything tomorrow morning uh, with the new, the new motherboard is a definite. I'm going to switch out that graphics card. I'm going to get the two dims instead of four dims of, of memory. And uh, that keyboard just won't get bought. So, uh, <laughs> very. I'm so, really glad that I talked to you guys because I knew that I was probably doing something wrong. I didn't realize how much I was doing wrong. So doing no, it was a good wrong. overall build. It was good. Thanks. I, I think you'll be happy, and uh, yeah, you're gonna have a lot of performance. I don't know what you're upgrading from to this, but this is basically the the the, the fastest kind of consumer gaming PC you can buy, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I needed you, know, you could go SLI and all that other crazy stuff, but. I needed this it to good. almost do everything because it needed to edit video, it needed to game, and it needed to stream. And and uh, I I knew it was going to be expensive, but it, it just kind of is a tool that I needed to use for everything. That's always cool. a way to think of tools. Right. <laughs> One tool to do it all. Um, Chad, a pleasure as always, sir. Thank you. Posted. We want pictures of the final build. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. One thing I'm not LCD. doing is I'm not going to LED crazy. I I can't stand the the cold cathode ray tubes and stuff. I'm, I'm not going. Oh, lighting inside your case. I'm and not stuff. doing that. No, it's going to no. be dark. It's not. And yeah, I'm I think not you're doing several that. years late for that trend. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. We are about to run out of time, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to do more of your viewer questions next week. So, Ryan, what is coming up? Exciting, actually, week on PC Per. Not that it's never not an exciting week on PC Per. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of really cover. exciting stuff. Hey, I'm on your website a lot. Um, the, uh, you know, we've got, um, there's going to be a new graphics card release again next week. Go figure. It'll be on the low end side, though, the very budget conscious side. So, stay tuned for that if you're interested in that. We're going to have uh, reviews of a couple different motherboards. One of them being Thunderbolt based. This one actually from MSI, and uh, we've got we've, we're going to do a couple more reviews of systems. Uh, we've got a small form factor mini ITX system with a GTX 680 in it, and we got it. We just got a system in shipped into us in a big wooden crate. That's how you know you're getting something good when it comes in a wooden crate, uh, and mm -hmm. it's a Origin PC with dual GTX 690s. Nice. We're keeping it fairly simple at Techzilla. We just did uh, talk about Samsung's textiles, which can basically can turn their stickers and turn any object into a device that supports near field communications. Huh. Uh, we talked projectors versus large screens and why you don't really need to spend a lot of money on a, on, on a physical screen for your projector. And we have uh, some fun with so Pelican, 
the case manufacturers decided they wanted to do a consumer brand because apparently Pelican doesn't have an awesome enough consumer reputation as it is, Pelican being the case manufacturer. Right. And they did a crush-proof notebook, the Urban Elite U100, uh, and I had some quality time with that. Like like a laptop? No, a, a backpack. with Basically, it's a backpack. Oh, okay. Backpack with a Pelican case for your notebook built in. Awesome. <laughs> yes, yeah. actually, uh, uh, there's just one flaw. It is awesome, but there is one flaw. All right. And, uh, we, we talk about that on the tech show. So that's it for this edition of Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. Twitch at twit.tv is the email. We'll have the usual slate of emails next week. And hopefully in the near future, we'll report from Chad on how it's built That's it for this edition of Twitch. I'm Patrick Gordon. I'm Ryan Trout. See you next week on Twitch.